Hi, this week we'll be continuing our studies of the 1980s and we'll be taking it into the 1990s a little bit. And we're going to do that by first beginning our focus here on NBC. And in the 1980s, NBC rises to the top of the networks again, led by Brandon Tartikoff. And he does this primarily with a um, kind of interesting strategy to compete with cable television. And one of those is slow growth strategy. And what this means is that um, television programs that he felt were quality, that had a potential to gain an audience, were given that time. Instead of just being yanked after an unsuccessful season or two, there's shows that um, kind of got their footing in their third or fourth uh, season. And Seinfeld is one of those. And Seinfeld goes on to become um, one of seen as one of the greatest of all sitcoms, one of the finest of its genre. Without that um, slow grow strategy employed by Tartikoff, we might not have even had Seinfeld around long enough for it to succeed. Certainly not to that level. Um, other networks uh, see this, they quickly follow. Um, there's a show that I really like, it's a really strange quirky show that was on CBS called Northern Exposure. And Northern Exposure was seen as quality by its network and also allowed that chance to um, grow an audience. Uh, we'll also look at Cheers, and we started looking at the notion of the individual versus the group a little bit um, last week in our studies. You'll really see that here with Cheers. Cheers is a show that does that um, significantly, and Cheers is also talking about the economic situation happening in America in the 1980s. Um, we'll see one of the uh, bartenders, Diane, she has a master's degree. She's gone to college. She has a um, a master's degree in English, I believe, and yet she's relegated to doing the jobs that she did to get through college. And that's um, the reality that a lot of people faced in the 1980s. And quite frankly, people are still facing those realities um, to this day. Another show that's on NBC in the 1980s, widely popular across all demographics, is The Cosby Show. And The Cosby Show was really, truly one of TV's last blockbusters, which means that everybody tuned in when Cosby was on. It was um, people across races. It's, uh, of course, The Cosby Show is depicting a black family, a very successful black family. The mother is a lawyer and the father um, is a doctor. And the children tend to go to college. These are high achieving Cosby family. And they do um, present a black point of view, a black family life, but it gets a lot of uh, criticism in the 1980s because um, many minority families were suffering during this decade. It was like a downturn um, in the economy and a lot of people, especially uh, blacks, were suffering with um, joblessness, homelessness, etc. However, I would contest that having the Cosby Show present this black family as the all-American family is actually quite radical. And um, this week we're gonna be looking at the unsavory situation that's happened with uh, Bill Cosby in the last few years. He's currently in um, prison right now serving a three to 10 year sentence um, for rape. And we'll look at an article from um, New York Magazine as you do your reflection essay this week and there'll be 35 different women who come out in 2015 is when this article is published and uh, the allegations that they are laying against him at this time prior to his conviction and um, sentencing which is where we're at now in the story what i'm wondering is how does this impact this show how do these unsavory uh, acts that mr cosby has committed and um, he's raped women he's drugged women it's not good at all he's been found guilty and he is serving time but how does the actions of this individual affect the legacy of this show and I want you guys to kind of consider that in your reflection essays this week and like all our reflection essays there's not a right or wrong answer it's about you arguing however this week I am asking you to argue using that source and the reason I'm doing that is our um, final papers are due in just a few weeks here at the end of week 14. And this will just give us a little bit of practice and I can kind of guide you if you're having trouble. So either quote or paraphrase 
um, a little bit from that uh, article in the reflection essay. And those um, directions are really clear in the reflection essay assignment area as well. So it's something to think about. Um, I know that there's been musicians or visual artists that I love their work, but if I have an unsavory encounter with them personally or I hear things like this, uh, it, it does impact how I feel about the music or the art. And um, having the Cosby show, having Bill Cosby be like the all-American father with this kind of stuff that comes out decades later, it impacts how people are approaching the show now. And I'll just say, um, as someone who's been showing screenings and clips of the Cosby show and a different world for quite some time here, it has gotten harder. It's gotten a little bit harder to um, find the material itself. And so that's something that I can attest to, and I'm sure your other um, television instructors have seen that as well. Um, the thing about the Cosby show, and I kind of want to go back to, we'll, we'll do the whole conversation. You can do that in our discussion forum and then um, in the assignment about these um, acts and how that impacts the legacy. But I wanna kinda jump back just to the 1980s now and this show was huge. It was a hit, it was a gigantic hit, the biggest hit on NBC, which was the top network in the decade. And that's saying quite a lot. And it starts to open up a black point of view on um, other channels and uh, some of those are um, gonna be uh, shows that you're familiar with. I'm wearing my Bel Air Academy basketball jersey right now because I love the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. So if the Cosby show hadn't have had um, that level of success, would Will Smith have gotten a chance with his his first sitcom to become the giant movie star that he is now? And um, that's also uh, an NBC show. So the Fresh Prince is on NBC. And then we have um, a show called Hanging with Mr. Cooper on ABC, and Mr. Cooper's like a basketball coach, teacher. It's a really family-friendly show, but um, the primary protagonist is an African-American man, and that's pretty interesting, and that um, has quite a good run on ABC in the 90s, 92 to 97. And then um, there's another show that actually ends up being the longest-running black family on television, and that's a show called Family Matters. It starts out on ABC and then it goes to CBS. And maybe the last couple seasons aren't quite as good, but that's um, starring Jaleel White as Steve Urkel. And that's still, uh, most people are pretty familiar with that show to this um, day. And then we're gonna look at Fox when we get into the black aesthetic on television. It's a real surprise to people. Uh, Fox as a new network here at this time period had a recognition that the black audience wasn't really being reached through the other networks and they started programming shows quality black programming for black viewers and like a lot of things on Fox um, they were pretty interesting and I'm gonna name off a couple of those one of them's in living color and that stars uh, a very young Jim Carrey as well as the Waynes brothers and that was a very diverse sketch comedy show. I thought it was hilarious, personally. That was um, one I watched at that time period. And then Martin, starring Martin Lawrence. Um, Rock, which stars uh, Charles S. Dutton, and he goes on to a film career. And we are going to watch an ep uh, episode of Living Single, starring Queen Lativa. And that's a show that I really like a lot, and I think that you guys... Um, are going to be familiar with it. Sometimes when I taught this uh, class in person, there would be two theme, th theme songs that would get sung while I was doing my lecture. And one of them was Living Single, and the other one was The Fresh Prince. And uh, these are shows that um, they're not going back too far in time, and they're still uh, highly syndicated and are also available on streaming services. So I think that you guys are going to um, enjoy watching these. And then... One of the things we're going to look at here, too, today are the 1992 L.A. riots. And so one of the um, most interesting things, and of course, TV scholars and critics and so forth, can't we can't help but notice these kinds of things. So as the Cosby Show is airing its um, farewell episode, its final episode, we're saying goodbye to this all-American black family. 
the LA riots break out. And so Americans were actually being, um, having split screens at times where you would see the Cosby show and then the news would come on or it was, um, the juxtaposition maybe wasn't happening in a split screen. It all depended on how your station covered things, but maybe you watched that last episode of the Cosby show and, and bid farewell. And then you watched a racially charged riot right afterwards on the news. And the um, L.A. riots happened in 1992. They happened between April 29th and May 4th. Over 50 people are killed and a billion dollars of damages. It was um, very significant and it was a highly televised event. It'll be like a pretty short documentary. It's like 20 some minutes long, not quite a half an hour that we will screen today about that. And, um, of course, what ignites the L.A. riots are in 1991, there's a guy named Rodney King, who I'm sure you've all heard about. He became quite infamous from this incident. And as he's being um, arrested, there's he's beat brutally by police, and it's caught on a camera. And, again, this is 1991. This isn't 2020 where this is common, where everybody has a cell phone and everybody's able to... Um, have cameras at their disposal. In 1991, this was one of the first incidences of this um, type of activity by police being caught on tape. And of course, right now, in the time period we're living in right now with Black Lives Matters and um, with the numerous police shootings um, with George Floyd up in Minneapolis, um, here in my hometown, there was an unarmed a teenager named Tony Robinson who was shot by police and killed a couple years ago. And these uh, incidences are getting a lot of um, attention and being caught on um, cameras and shared on social media. Back in 1991, this was not happening all the time. And then when uh, people saw this footage, it was shocking. It outraged people. And when the police officers were acquitted and um, found innocent of charges, the city kind of blew up. And so um, it, this is something that I wish that here in our time period here, uh, we're already, you know, it's the, it's the 2020s. We should be past this, but um, we're not at all. So it's been almost 30 years since the um, incident that we'll watch with the Rodney King beating and then with the LA riots in 1992 and I wish that I could say that American society has come farther, but um, I'm really sorry to say that, that I can't. And television is still here. It's still a witness. And now we're seeing these kinds of um, incidences play out, not just on our television screen through the news, but through social media and on the internet as well. And so the changing technology is impacting what people see, how they see it, and what they think. And I want you guys to start thinking about all of those things as we continue our studies in this class and as you um, leave this, this class and go into the world of television on your own. Thank you for your attention.